It's our number one hazard, so safely decommissioning it is our number one priority. The Magnox Swarf Storage Silo, the biggest challenge in our big four legacy ponds and silos. So this is the Magnox Swarf Storage Silo. It comprises of 22 concrete silos. It's been built since the early 1960s and extended three times in total. Each of them is the size of uh, about six double-decker buses. Uh, they're water-filled and the waste is predominantly the products of Magnox reprocessing. So it's uh, a corroded Magnox alloy uh, that over time has degraded into a sludge. The corrosion of the um, of the swarf uh, creates hydrogen gas, which we're all aware of is, is highly flammable. So we're constantly having to ventilate each of the compartments to make sure we don't get an unnecessary buildup of hydrogen. The reaction that's taking place is also exothermic. Uh, so it's naturally wanting to heat. Uh, and as it heats, the uh, creation of hydrogen starts to accelerate. So it's really quite important that we maintain temperatures in here. So we're constantly cooling the silo liquors as well. It's a very hazardous environment. There is nothing comparable, certainly that we're aware of, anywhere in Europe or possibly the world. Emptying the facility is expected to take more than two decades. Due to the complexity of the task, it's taken a similar amount of time to plan and prepare for the job. This facility was never designed to be emptied. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the thinking was about what would happen to this material in the fullness of time. Um, but that legacy has been handed on to us, we have to deal with it, we have to take that responsibility. So it's important that we get this material out, uh, certainly in our generation, uh, and make sure we leave things safe for those, those coming along after. For the benefit of the long-term uh, hazard reduction that we know we've got to achieve, we may have to accept some short-term increases in risk along the way. This is the first of the three mighty machines which will be grabbing the waste and lifting it out. The silo emptying plant weighing nearly 400 tonnes and lifted into the building in 22 different modules before being reassembled inside. Some waste was taken out of the newest part of the building in the 1990s with a different machine to prove the retrieval's concept. But these shielded caves on rails are what's needed for the big job ahead. So the process for retrieving waste, which we have trialled back in the 90s, uh, successfully demonstrated, it's quite simple really. The machine itself uh, locks itself over a, a silo and seals itself round a hole. Uh, the basis of the machine is a, um, a hydraulic grab on a hoist drum. So we lower it into the silo, uh, close the grab and grab and pick up whatever waste it, it happens to find there. Um, so we're not selecting specific um, elements of waste, it's more like a fairground grab, uh, a lucky dip arrangement if you like. When the uh, grab is retracted into an operator bulge where we can see what we've got, um, the waste is, is tipped or dropped into a um, stainless steel skip, which is effectively a metre cubed uh, biscuit tin. Uh, and we continue to repeat that cycle until we've got sufficient waste to fill the skip. The skip is then withdrawn along a tunnel that's part of the machine and lifted into a bottom opening flask, which is sitting on top of the machine, um, which shields the waste, but also acts as a transport container to move it to another facility elsewhere on site. These machines have been tested extensively at the manufacturer's work. Most of the moving parts have been endurance tested, thousands upon thousands of cycles to give us confidence that, again, they've got the life. Because maintenance on these pieces of equipment, whilst it's not impossible, is very difficult in many cases. And to get the sorts of availabilities that we're looking for, uh, we need to make sure that we're putting in tried and tested technology. We built a, a replica of one of the silos and each of those is about 16 metres deep and as I said the size of about six double-decker buses is quite enormous when you go and stand next to one uh, and it gives you an idea of emptying these is, is a bit like uh, em emptying a dustbin with a teaspoon. As well as planning to get the waste out we've also worked hard to keep the facility safe in the meantime. To support those machines, we've had to refit the entire building um, to recognise that we've got a 20-year mission or so ahead of us. So we've rewired, replumbed new ventilation systems, new systems for managing the silo liquor, which is a very aggressive byproduct of the of the hazards that we're dealing with, uh, and a whole host of other uh, new systems that will last the, last the life of retrievals. It's important that we carefully consider any modifications we're going to do to the facility. This is one of the most significant nuclear hazards that exists anywhere in the, in the world, possibly. 
Um, so it's, it, it needs careful consideration before you go making changes. A, to ensure that you understand the modifications you're going to make. B, that you're not going to make the situation any worse. And thirdly, that whatever we do do is going to last the 20, 25 years that it might take to enter the, uh, the silos fully. We're always exploring new ways to improve and innovate. Squeezing this specially designed remotely operated vehicle through a six inch entry hole into the silo liquor is a world first. Once inside, it's a fresh pair of eyes on the problem and could be another tool for reducing hazard and risk. It's all part of a massively complex programme where safety is the overriding priority. It's important that we get into the start of retrievals as soon as we can, but we have to be measured in our approach. This is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. The important message is that we get to the end of the retrievals programme as soon as we possibly can. And we wouldn't like to look back and, made, and, and see that we made any strange decisions that impacted that simply to try and get into the start of retrievals um, earlier than may, maybe we needed to. Making sure you get to the start line in, a, in the best condition you possibly can will put us in the best place to um, accelerate through the retrievals process and finish it at the earliest possible time. And we're constantly looking at simplification. Simplification means um, acceleration in most cases. If we've got complex processes they tend to be difficult and take longer. So whatever we can do in simplification on the end-to-end -end process, so it's not just in here, it's with the transport of the waste, it's with the downstream processing, it's with the storage of the waste. We're looking at all opportunities across the value stream. Getting the waste out is one thing, but it all has to go somewhere. We've saved hundreds of millions of pounds and speeded up the disposal route by simplifying the waste treatment process from 22 steps to three. The skips that are filled in the silo will be placed in three metre cubed boxes to be kept in our engineered stores for up to 75 years before they go into a geological disposal facility. This facility and the decommissioning of this facility, the emptying of the facility is the most technically challenging program anywhere in the NDA estate. Um, I think it's also um, probably the most hazardous facility um, in terms of risk to the public, um, along with one or two others in the, in the Ponds and Silos estate. But it's certainly right up there uh, in terms of national priorities for, for dealing with, with hazardous waste, which is hence why the investment that's available to, uh, to, to progress this mission uh, is as it is. We are trailblazing. It may well have um, applications in other, other facilities, not necessarily on the Sellafield site, but, but elsewhere in the world. And the decommissioning uh, the world is a very small one, um, so there is a lot of interaction goes on between various players. So I'd like to think that the learning that we get here will be translated elsewhere.